um, and tell you about the work that's been going on in my lab for qu uh, quite a while and, and, it's kind of, and probably um, uh, is very different from what we've been talking about today. But here's, here's my, my, my only sex chromosome slide. <laughs> Um, I will point out, actually, it's an anomaly because I, of, of the eight PhDs I've graduated from my lab. There are four of them are women and four of them are men. Um, so it's a super anomaly right now in my lab. So uh, anyway, it's, it's a bit weird. <laughs> All right. Uh, the work I'm going to tell you about today um, is, uh, I'm going to talk about now is uh, to stuff on meiosis inventories. I'll talk a little bit about rotifers and if I've got some time, our ongoing project on uh, snails, uh, snail genomes that I'm doing with Maureen Neiman and her lab. All right, so let's talk about sex. Uh, the questions that, you know, when, when we start talking about this, what is sex, why do it, uh, when and how did sex evolve, I'm gonna actually talk about that one, um, but I'm not gonna talk about this one, okay? Um, all right, so when, when we think about sex, actually, um, sort of, uh, we, we often are thinking about uh, the processes uh, in which this, this thing happens, the getting together of gametes. So the, the behaviors and the mechanisms and all that kind of stuff going on with regard to getting together gametes. But, uh, so, I, so the yin and yang is really, it, but you gotta get the gametes, right? So it turns out, um, when, I, when I started thinking about the molecular evolution of sex, I wanted to study something that was, that was highly conserved, that I could study across all eukaryotes, et cetera. And it turns out that this process, is, um, as many of you might know, is actually highly diverse among um, lineages of eukaryotes. But, it, but as it turns out, this process, meiosis, is actually highly conserved, and I'll show you some information on that. So, so to study the sort of uh, three or so, maybe two and a half billion years of eukaryotic evolution, um, uh, we needed something that's conserved, and it turns out meiosis has been pretty good for us, and, and it allows us also to learn something about how meiosis evolves. All right, so, so sex is the rule. Most eukaryotes have uh, do sex as part of their life cycle or do it every once in a while, et cetera. Um, but of course, asexuality is, is also quite common. Um, so so uh, widely widespread across eukaryotes, plants, animals, fungi, protists, et cetera. Um, often are asexual, including some organisms that we don't know are having sex, and I'll get to that toward the end. Um, so, so why, so gonna, since it's a public talk, I thought I'd put my stuff in here about sort of the uh, sort of basics here. So why sex? What is it good for? Insert Tina Turner there. Um, so really what we're talking about is, is uh, what is the adaptive significance of sex, so as evolutionary biologists? Um, so it turns out that there's lots of risks and uh, costs that are associated with sexual reproduction. It's a, it's, you know, it's a pretty problematic process. So those include things like searching for a mate, time and energy. Um, maybe your mate requires some investment, food, territory, defense, my, my favorite for humans. Um, okay, so uh, risk of sexually transmitted disease. <laughs> Um, and, of course, dangerous liaisons, of course, which the famous one, of course, shown here. Okay, so, um, so, so, so sex is, doesn't come without cost. So, you know, why is this complicated process? Why did it arise? Why does it persist in the face of all these various costs? Um, so why do it at all? So, you know, wouldn't be a sex meeting without having a picture of John Maynard Smith. Um, so, so he thought about this a lot, wrote a whole book about it. Um, so, it, you know, in populations that can reproduce both sexually and asexually, and there's lots of organisms that can, uh, so why doesn't asexuality take over? So uh, it, it turns out there's one, one part of it is this, this idea of the twofold cost of sex. Um, that is that, that only females can make babies, and so the rate of, the rate of increase of a population if, if you're reproducing asexually is, uh, is, is double at every generation if you're a, uh, an asexual compared to a sexual because sexual populations have to invest approximately half of their energy into making uh, us useful, useless males um, <laughs> useful only in making uh, the next generation. All right. um, so, so then why aren't most uh, organisms asexual? And, and um, so, you know, asexual reproduction should take over under that kind of simple idea but it's not the case. We know that it's not the case. Um, so most organisms reproduce uh, sexually, but, but uh, both sexual and asexual modes are present. So sex must have some benefits that overcome advantages of asexual reproduction. So that's the sort of basics of the origin and maintenance of sex. So, so it turned out that there's lots of theories for maintaining sex, and I call them the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
Um, and the good um, is, is that increased variation is good, sex brings good mutations together, and that's attributed to people like Weissman and Fisher, um, and uh, in contrast, the bad. So, of course, uh, in the absence of sex, and in the, or very large populations, deleterious mutations will accumulate in asexuals, and that's attributed to Herman Muller. And then the ugly was a little bit of a stretch, but um, so uh, one, one idea is that, is that sex is a way of uh, keeping up with changing environments, including biological environments in which organisms are, uh, find themselves. So that's attributed, of course, to Bill Hamilton. Okay, so that's, that's a sort of backdrop to sort of these more global issues about the evolution, origin, and maintenance of sex. But I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to answer all that, so, uh, so I'm going to move this back to the origin and evolution of meiosis. So the big questions are, when did meiosis, and thus, thus sex, if you'll buy that, right? So those two things are inextricably combined in eukaryotes. Um, how did it arise? Um, from what prior functions did it derive? Um, how has it subsequently evolved, given that it did arise? Um, and a key question is, can it be lost? Is it possible that this important part of biology is actually, you know, is, is capable of being lost? Um, and then the sort of career-wise, career-long, and probably careers of many of you in the room <laughs> to answer what are the consequences of, of understanding meiosis evolution to the persistence of sex. Okay, so I'm going to try to answer the ones in red. All right, so... Um, so this is a molecular phylogenetic tree of, of all life based on small subunit ribosomal RNA. This was the view of life when I was, in a, when I was a graduate student. Um, and, group, and life was thought to be in those sort of three big kingdoms, um, including these organisms over here, eukaryotes, and there we are up here uh, in the animal group. But, but our view of eukaryotic diversity was such that these single-celled lineages of eukaryotes, the protists, were actually uh, represented almost all the diversity of eukaryotes, and in particular, uh, pe we, people, myself included, were interested in these lineages that were the earliest branches on the eukaryotic tree. And these are microsporidia, trichomonads, and diplomonids. There's Giardia, meet Giardia, I hope you haven't met him before. Um, anyway, so it turns out that when I first started working on this, that we didn't, we didn't know that any of these had sex. Um, so it gave rise to this idea that, that and, and meiosis, so we didn't know anything about them. So it gave rise to this idea that meiosis could have evolved late during eukaryotic evolution um, and, that, and that we could learn something about sort of, th these are true eukaryotes, but they maybe had, uh, that sex has arisen, meiosis and sex has arisen somewhere during eukaryotic evolution. This is, the, this is actually not, an up to, not up to date in terms of date kind of tree, but it's actually up to date in terms of what we know. It turns out that, that back to here, um, all these lineages of eukaryotes actually have sort of combined together, and we actually don't really know what the actual deep relationships among eukaryotes are, except to know that things like animals and plant, animals and fungi go together, plants, there's a group of protists, another group of protists, another group. So, so we're learning something about it, but um, we don't, those, those so-called early branching lineages aren't really necessarily early branching. Um, so it led some colleagues of mine, and, and it turns out that many of the organisms in here, we know something about their biology, and it led some people to sort of start thinking about what, what this common ancestor looked like, and it looks like it maybe was a whole eukaryote. And I'm going to give you the data about meiosis. And it turns out that we have pretty good evidence that meiosis, and, and thus sex, uh, is present at the common ancestor of all eukaryotes. Okay, so, so back to ribosome RNA, just for, to, from a point of view, is that, is that there we are with our, with our fungal relatives. And the reason why I show you this is, is that this is, um, when I first started working on this, this was almost all we knew about how meiosis worked came from animals and fungi. We knew very little, we knew very little about the rest of the tree of life with regard to meiosis. So uh, this was a slide I put together for a meiosis meeting, pointing out the organisms that were talked about at the meiosis meeting. A little bit of plants, but mostly animals and fungi. So the goal was to try to figure out from what we knew about animals and fungi if we could learn about the rest of eukaryotic diversity. So this was the, uh, it's that same tree that I showed, the unresolved tree is sort of splayed out a little bit. So this is as of, I forget what the date on this, oh yeah, 2003. This is, the little boxes represent genomes that were available in about 2003. There's animals and fungi, but you can see there's a smattering of protist genomes. And so what I was trying to do is learn from the genes that were present and shared amongst animals and fungi whether those genes were actually widely distributed across eukaryotes, okay? So, um, so that's, those same genomes are mapped on here, and, uh, in a, you know, in eight years' time, we actually filled out the tree of eukaryotes with at least one genome, and I stopped, I stopped updating this in 2011 when 
at least one genome was available from all the major lineages of eukaryotes, okay? So that's important uh, in a minute. So, so and we actually have a much better sampling, including some stuff on some posters back here uh, from various groups of, of eukaryotes, uh, in particular uh, protozoa. So what do we know about the sex lives of protists and more broadly eukaryotes? And we don't know a lot, actually. Um, a lot of it is absence of evidence. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of these organisms are pe things that people don't study very well or one or two lab studies. So uh, hopefully we'll learn more about it in the next, in the next few decades. Okay. So now I've got to talk a little bit about, see what I'm doing. Sorry. Okay. Good. I'm d doing good time. This is my University of Iowa meiosis slide. Um, so just a reminder that um, to study meiosis, meiosis is in these, has these two divisions, and there's genes and therefore proteins that are, carried, that are carrying out jobs in these two uh, parts of meiosis. And all the good stuff happens in meiosis one. It's all the stuff that's unique to meiosis. Meiosis two is essentially my, mitosis. So if you're teaching genetics, you can use that. Um, so uh, so the, the novelty of meiosis and those genes are carried out in meiosis one. And I'll just skip by this to point out this, uh, that all the interesting stuff about meiosis actually is occurring here. So pairing, recombination, et cetera, are going on during meiosis one. So we wanted to pick some genes. They had to be, um, and this was sort of the best case, we, we wanted genes to be meiosis specific, conserved. Um, I won't talk about gene duplications today, but I will tomorrow. Um, but the best genes, if I, you know, if I could pick them out of a you know, best case scenario would be all organisms that are doing it would have all the genes. Those that aren't wouldn't have any of the genes, right? So that would be best case scenario. I'm telling you now it's not gonna, it's not the way evolution worked, but that would be the best case scenario. Okay. So I started doing these inventories, and this is an early inventory of these kind of genes. Genes along the top, organisms along the side, uh, colored columns indicate meiosis specific or as far as we knew they mostly were involved in meiosis and so you could see that these genes are widely distributed across different kinds of eukaryotes and in particular we were interested in these putatively early branching things like Giardia and trichomonas and they seem to have a bunch of the genes involved in meiosis and and, uh, and so that ga gave us a lot of confidence that well we were able to uh, make inferences across you know about almost three billion years of evolution okay um, so those are the organisms, and these weren't known to have these weren't known to have sex. So we were able to find evidence at the molecular level that they were capable of having sex. Later on, people have studied things like Giardia and found that there there are cycles that are probably meiotic in nature. Um, I'm just going to these these are my eye charts. So um, we keep marching. We add more genes. We add more taxa. You can see it's a little bit spotty, right? So so some genes are present. Maybe sometimes we can't find them. Um, but things like Giardia and Trichomonas, they seem to have a pretty large set of these genes. And, um, and you know, compared to things like us and, and Saccharomyces who have all these genes. So, um, so in, you know, it, it is the case that these have been being retained for over long periods of evolutionary time among eukaryotes. And the places where either we can't find them or they're missing are clear cases of, of loss or, we, you know, we ascertainment. Um, just another eye chart, just for fun, but we just keep moving forward. Uh, as genomes get added we, and, and more genes get added, we can continue to sort of uh, take this approach. This is sort of, um, and I'm going to talk about this more tomorrow, but this is sort of a relatively current um, depiction of, of, of that gene inventory. And the important part is that we've now surveyed, uh, we've surveyed the presence or absence of meiosis genes across every major uh, super kingdom of eukaryotes. So we don't think we're missing any lineages of eukaryotes from this kind of analysis. So the results from that are, number one, that m the molecular machinery uh, for uh, meiosis evolved once and early, and if there are cases of asexuals amongst eukaryotes, it would have been a derived case and not an ancestral case. So that's message number one. That leaves me about three minutes for message number two. Okay, so what about everybody else? Um, these genes have limitations. They're useful, but, but one gene is not enough because we can't just use one gene and say whether they're sexual or not. Um, and so we wanted to use it as a test. So going into asexual genomes and then ask, uh, is, my, you know, is everybody doing it? Is a particular thing doing it? Is everybody doing it? And then can, is it possible to lose sex? So this is my fun slide. So, um, so we're just going to use a, um, an arbitrary example of an asexual eukaryote, and it turns out that SpongeBob, according to his creator, even though he's called Bob, is asexual, okay? Um, so here's what we would do is, is we might, before this meiosis inventory, we might go out and look for recombination. Uh, 
Um, but, but instead, we're going to go sequence SpongeBob's genome and ask whether meiosis genes are present. Um, we could maybe go back and do population genetics. How many, which ones? Is it all of them? Is it only one? Is it groups of them that make sense, et cetera? Um, are they expressed? In particular, when and where? Are they expressed in an orderly fashion like we would expect? Because we know something about these, how these genes work. Are they functional? Um, a colleague of mine at Iowa um, tried to put together a yeast test system to do complementation. It turns out to be really hard. It's not impossible, but um, that's sort of on hold. Um, the, the end game might be, can we, can, we get, can we get him to do it? Can we get him to turn on meiosis? Because if so, um, you know, he's not a putative asexual. And, you know, none of us really want to know what SpongeBob looks like. Okay, so, okay, solved. So that's the sort of idea. So our SpongeBob that we started with, really, we've been working on a bunch of these, but the one that we started working on are um, rotifers. And so dolloid rotifers are, are quite famous for being uh, asexual and anciently asexual, ostensibly. Um, their closest sister taxon are these things called monogonots. These are uh, facultatively sexual organisms. So these are, these are supposedly all girls. Um, these probably are all girls, actually. The question is whether there are males around every once in a while. These are actually can flip between sex and asex. Uh, so a bunch of evidence suggesting that they're asexual. It's all circumstantial, actually. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of evidence. So you can guess what we did. We, we, we went in and looked for these meiosis-specific genes, because if they're present, then that would suggest that they're able to do meiosis. If not, that would be consistent with ancient asexuality under a use-it-or-lose-it kind of model. Okay, so we had this set of genes. We've got a poster back here that's starting to use that uh, method as well. Um, using degenerate PCR, et cetera. So I just uh, skipped to the data. I'll talk a little bit more about it tomorrow. Um, so here are the um, uh, dolloid rotifers, monogonot rotifers. Here are the genes. The ones in pink are these ostensibly meiosis-specific things. Um, we found a bunch of things, uh, in particular this one, MSH5. But we found evidence for meiosis-specific genes in, in these organisms. Um, but we were, you know, we were not terribly confident because uh, we found other things by degenerate PCR, et cetera. Um, so the interpretations were maybe they're capable of doing sex, uh, maybe they're present but not expressed, um, maybe the ones that they have are doing something different, um, maybe meiosis is present but it's used for uh, automixis, which is sort of having sex with yourself, and um, there are some benefits, uh, short-term and maybe long-term benefits for that process. Um, and then the other thing was maybe they're horizontally transferred. So. Um, while we were doing this, a, a genome was being sequenced, and so the genome came out, and here's the genome, and it turns out that um, they found this gene. They found, actually, it's paralog, which actually works in a heterodimer with it, so that's, that makes sense. Found a couple of more genes, SPO11, which is the thing that makes double strand breaks, and HOP1, which is involved in SNAP nemo complex. So, in, you know, so it's four that they have as opposed to four or five that they don't have, so how are you going to interpret this? Um, so they the authors of this paper interpreted it as it doesn't seem to have meiosis. And they made an argument based on the fact that in meiosis you have to have collinear chromosomes, homologs to be pairing and stuff, and they couldn't imagine that that was going on. Um, so uh, I'll leave it to you to think about it, and I think it's still an, un an unanswered question, um, to be honest. All right. So the summary is that uh, what is the significance? Maybe they have the capacity for meiosis. Maybe they're doing something else, um, but we don't, you know, maybe the genes have been transferred. Let's see how much time I've got. I might have, oh, looks like i got five seconds. So I've got enough time to tell you about another ongoing project, just for a minute. I only have two slides, so. This is an ongoing project with Maureen Neiman at the University of Iowa, and, and this is, a, this is a, a snail system from, uh, from New Zealand, and these snails, it's one species of snail, but there's multiple lineages of asexuality that have arisen. There's, your, there's Maynard Smith again showing up. Um, and it turns out that, that there's been multiple transitions to asexuality in this one species. And so we've been sequencing the genomes of these various uh, lineages. We call them lineages because they're ostensibly one species to look at. Uh, th these are, in fact, bona fide asexuals. But the question is, can we uh, detect what's happening in the absence of sex? Uh, we don't have any really answers yet, but I just wanted to make you aware of that. So here are the answers. Um, so when did meiosis arise? I think, um, and I'll show you more tomorrow, um, early in eukaryotic evolution. Uh, how did it arise? I didn't talk much about this, so I'll tell you more about it tomorrow, but it turns out that genes don't come out of nowhere. It turns out that there were existing genes that duplicated that gave rise to these new functions. Uh, 
Um, from what prior functions, again, I didn't talk about it, but these functions generally have to do with DNA handling and repair. How has meiosis subsequently evolved? Well, you saw some data. There's lots of gene loss. I didn't tell you about gene gain, and there's some new gene duplications. Um, can it be lost? Don't know yet. Um, still an open question, and uh, I think we can all stay tuned for a long time to answer those questions, so thanks very much.